Blessed be the name of the Lord, who is our rock, in whom our anchor firmly holds. Welcome to worship here at the Village Church at the Advent Christian Village in Dowling Park, Florida. We're glad that you can worship with us today, and we invite you to enjoy yourselves. I know some of you have gotten very used to worshiping in your pajamas with a cup of coffee in your hand. But we're glad that you're tuned in and that we encourage you to worship from your heart. Let's go before the Lord and ask him to be with us as we begin our worship this morning. And as we close with this prayer, we'll do the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray to our Lord. God, we thank you so much for allowing us to be together in one form or fashion to worship you. Lord, we pray that our worship would be honoring to you, that our minds would be focused and giving attention to you, that the words that are proclaimed through song and the reading of your word and the proclamation of your word would touch us and move us to um, be mindful of those around us and to love those in our neighborhoods and our families and to express Christ's love to them. Lord, as we worship you this morning, may we focus completely on you. May we uh, be renewed by you this morning. And may we give you glory and honor. Lord, as we think about these things, we think about uh, those who were unsure how to pray and ask Jesus, and he taught them to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What a privilege it is to worship our Lord this morning. Part of worship is giving him praise, and we invite you to sing with us this morning. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Oh, 
Scripture from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are His deeds, and His righteousness endures forever. He has caused His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear Him. He remembers His covenant forever. He has shown His people the power of His works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of His hands are faithful and just. All His precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for His people. He ordained His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow His precepts have good understanding. To Him belongs eternal praise. May God's blessing abide with the reading and the hearing of His Word. Before we go into our time of prayer, I want to share a few thoughts. First thing I want to remind you of is the video we just saw concerning India. The vast majority of India does not know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Matthew 9, 37 and 38 says, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. John MacArthur wrote an article entitled, do you pray for the lost? If you're praying for India, you're praying for the lost. Matter of fact, if you're praying for any country, the harvest is plentiful. Before Jesus gave up His Spirit as He hung on the cross, He took time to pray for those who were murdering Him. He prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. If we separated that prayer from Scripture, we might wonder if Jesus' prayer on the cross was answered. Well, Jesus' prayer on the cross was answered in that day and continues to be answered today. He started answering that prayer on the day of Pentecost when Peter prayed or preached that great sermon which the people responded to. And 3,000 believed and were baptized. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse, 30, verse 12, we read these words. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul in, unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many, and made inter intercession for the transgressors. Jesus indeed has set the example for us. John MacArthur, in his article, Do You Pray for the Laws, has this paragraph, which I'm changing the tense of the pronouns from uh, first person or second person to uh, first person plural. He writes, do we have a heart to pray for the lost like Jesus did? 
Do we have the passion that inspired John Knox to plead, give me Scotland or I die? Is our attitude that of George Whitefield who prayed, O Lord, give me souls or take my soul? Do we like Henry Martin mourn when we see others trapped in false religion and cry out, I cannot endure existence if Jesus is to be so dishonored. God used those faithful men as powerful tools to bring salvation to a dying people. Each of them had a clear and vivid understanding of what is at stake in the Gospel. It's an issue of life and death. Do we realize that our unbelieving family members, our co-workers, our neighbors will suffer death and destruction in the fires of judgment? That realization should drive us to our knees to plead not only with them to believe the Gospel, but with God to save their souls. This morning, I urge you to pray for the lost. To share the Gospel with those that you know that don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord. You say, but I, I'm trapped in my room. I can't go anywhere. If the Apostle Paul had used that excuse in his own life, there would have been a many people not within the family of God because Paul used the opportunity that he had even as a prisoner to proclaim the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father God, we lift our hearts to You. Acknowledging You as God. Acknowledging that indeed You have created us. You have created this world. You have given us all that there is in this world. You are indeed God the Creator. Your love and Your mercy endures forever. You are faithful. We confess to You our need for You. We confess our sin. For we need forgiveness. We need to repent. We confess our need for You to carry our burdens. Therefore, we cast our cares upon You because we know You care for us. We pray, Father, for Your provision. For Your love to minister to us. But also to minister through us. We pray for Your church, Father, that we might live faithfully that we might share Your grace, Your love, Your compassion. That we might share the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pause, Father, to consider those who don't know You as Savior and Lord. Father, lay these individuals upon our hearts. Love these individuals through us. And may we be so bold as to proclaim the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ with them that they might come to a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank You, Father, that You are seeking those who are lost. And when they turn to You, You bring transformation into their lives. You turned their lives from hopelessness to hope. I pray, Father, that we as Your church might be diligent in proclaiming Your Word, the Gospel of saving grace 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. continue in worship as we sing about Jesus being our firm foundation
We'll hear from the Word of the Lord from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12-19 through 19 this morning. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name, for it is to for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Randy, and for all of you who have helped lead us in worship today. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal, Peter wrote. Sounds pretty similar to the words that we all just joined in singing a few moments ago. The fourth verse of how firm a foundation when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all-sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. That's a classic old hymn that goes all the way back to the, the late 1700s that Christians have been singing all these years singing about the faithfulness of God through the experience of fiery trials. Those words echo the writings of multiple New Testament writers. James wrote, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must, must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Peter wrote earlier in this same letter that we're looking at today, and he said, In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, We sent Timothy, who is our brother, and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. We were destined for them. Trials are not a strange experience for us in life, and especially for us who have chosen to respond to the grace of God and the call to follow Him in our living. In the fourth chapter, in the 12th through 19, 19th verses that were just read for us by Randy, there's some things that just kind of jump out at us. One is that trials are common for Christians. They're common for everybody, but it is the rule, it is not the exception when we go through difficulties and trials in our lives. If you've just overcome one, then be encouraged, there's another one coming around the corner at some point. 
It's not like playing a, a hand of cards and where you get rid of your bad cards and you're all set. They just keep coming. Trials come in various categories. They come in various shapes. There are many kinds of trials that we face in the midst of our lives. There are physical trials and emotional trials. There are financial and relational and spiritual trials. They, they run a whole gamut, a whole spectrum from being insulted to literally facing physical persecution. They can come at any time. They can come in any season of life. They may be prolonged. They may be drawn out as like in a drawn out court case. They may be lingering. The trials might come in the form of a, of a nagging illness, for instance, that just keeps popping up and won't seem to respond and go away. Trials may be public in nature or they might be very, very private and no one knows what you're facing but you and the Lord. But be assured that He knows what you're facing. Trials can be related to our own sins. Trials can be related to the sins of others or they may not be related to sin at all. We can find ourselves in the midst of trials in the wake of someone else's decisions, someone else's actions. We don't all face the same kinds of trials. You might be in a room with four other people right now, and the trial that you're facing, they may not face. And the trial that they're facing, you may not face. So trials come in various categories. They're common to us. One of the things that trials accomplish is that they put our faith to the test and they stretch our confidence in God. We develop a confidence in God as He comes through for us and as we realize He really is faithful. He really won't leave us or forsake us. He really will provide hope and help in the midst of the difficulty. Without trials, we wouldn't mature in our faith. Trials have a tendency to simplify life for us. When we face difficulties, we find ourselves asking some very, very basic questions that we might not have seriously considered otherwise. We ask ourselves, what do I really believe about God in the midst of this time of great difficulty? What do I believe about God? What do I really believe about prayer? Do I believe that prayer makes a difference? What do I believe about this matter of depending on God and relying upon His resources? Do I believe that God is sovereign? Do I believe that God is good? You see, trials put our faith to the test. Aid Andre Crouch wrote a a song decades ago that is uh, a special song to a lot of us. It was called Through It All. And in that song he said, if I'd never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. Trials, some trials are brief, some are slight, some are soon forgotten. Yet others hang on and they weigh heavily upon us, in some cases perhaps for years. Now, those ones that hang on, 
those very, very significant trials, I believe, are the ones that Peter was writing about in this book of First Peter, particularly as he addresses it here in the fourth chapter. This, this letter that was circulated among the churches was written around 60 A.D. That was some approximately 30 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Peter wrote to a group of Christians who were facing very real trials, real persecution, desperate circumstances. They were facing undeserved suffering, unfair treatment, and unexpected calamities. These weren't always enjoyable times. Yet Peter wrote to offer hope and to offer help in the midst of those kinds of difficulties. He said, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery or painful trial that you're suffering as though something strange was happening to you. It's not unique to you and it shouldn't be unexpected. He says, don't be surprised. Again, I remind you that we Christians are not exempt from difficulties of life. We're not exempt from trials. In fact, there are some things that perhaps we're more prone to because of the stand that we have taken for our faith. I think we're starting to realize today that we stand out more than perhaps we ever have here in our nation if we make a determination that we we will honor Christ as the only means to the Father. And yet sometimes we find ourselves thinking, we may not verbalize it, but we find ourselves thinking, I can't believe this is happening to me. I mean, I love God. I've been serving God for years. I... I've tried to lead a good life. And now this is happening. We might think, why? Why doesn't God protect me from this? Whatever this is. Why would God allow this to happen to me or to to my family? And so Peter says, don't be surprised. Someone has said that life is, uh, life is like a schoolroom. And there are pop quizzes. <laughs> and there are tests. And there are exams. And some of them are hard. And Christian maturity, in many ways, can be measured by our ability to withstand the tests that come our way without without those tests throwing us into either an emotional or spiritual tailspin. When we are able to stand in the midst of the trial and the difficulty and stand in trust, sometimes we can't stand, sometimes they bring us to our knees, but our faith remains firm. Peter then does surprise us when he says he urges us to rejoice. Well, how do you rejoice? Well, he points us to the future when he says we can rejoice knowing that at Christ's return he'll bring with him relief and rewards for those who've lived faithfully, for those whose hope has been in him. Verses 13 and 14, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. Let me point you to the future. It might be future later today. It may be future who knows how far down the road. But Jesus has promised to return. And his reward is with him. And it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. James wrote in the first chapter, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, 
Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Peter shares with us some things to remember as we face the trials of life. He reminds us that trials provide an opportunity to draw upon divine power. He says, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. God enables you. He empowers you. He draws near in those times. One of the psalmists wrote, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. When we come to the end of our, as the songwriter wrote it, hoarded resources, our Father's giving is just begun. Just begun. We learn to lean upon the Lord. John Stallings wrote that song. I think the Blackwood Brothers made it very popular back in the day. Learning to lean, learning to lean. I'm learning to, G to lean on Jesus. Finding more power than I'd ever dreamed. I'm learning, learning to lean on Jesus. Peter tells us that we realize that sometimes the suffering that we face can be deserved. In fact, he encouraged us to make sure that if we're going to suffer, suffer for being a Christian, not for doing the wrong things, but he wrote in verse 15, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. In other words, avoid doing those things that are likely to result in suffering. Avoid making those bad decisions that could lead to suffering. Avoid seeing how close to sin you can come without actually committing sin. When you find yourself thinking, I probably shouldn't say this, or I probably shouldn't do this, then don't do it. Because it can result in suffering for you or for someone else. So make sure you're not engaged in activities that could bring reproach to the name of Christ. Peter, I think, alludes to the fact that suffering shouldn't cause us to feel shame. Verse 16, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Now, there are times in life where when you endeavor to honor Christ, perhaps you have to take a stand at work and, and you determine that because of your faith in Christ and because you know how he would have you to act or respond, perhaps you determine you're not going to be deceptive in your business dealings. Perhaps you determine that you're not going to be unethical in the way that you relate to customers. You might have to pay a price for that decision. You might be passed over for a promotion. You might, in fact, be let go by your employer. You might have to suffer because you're a Christian. Don't be ashamed of that. I, I have known people who have been let go from their jobs just for that reason. And I've told them, you don't need to be ashamed. You have done what you should do. The results, you trust God for. You know, the name Christian is only mentioned three times in the New Testament. And in fact, there are those who think it might have been used initially as a derogatory term. And Peter says, if you suffer for bearing the name of Christ, then there is no reason for shame, for you to experience any sense of shame in that. Some historians have written that in that first century, 
in which this letter was written, that Roman law required each citizen to pledge his loyalty to the emperor. Once a year, citizens would be put in the position of saying, Caesar is Lord. And when Christians rather confess that Jesus is Lord, they were put in a precarious position. Believers refused to bow to Caesar. Sometimes the Roman officials would write the name of Christ on the ground or on a wall and call upon the believer to spit upon that name. And if the Christian refused, they would be arrested, tried, and in some cases, killed. By bearing the name of Christ as Christian, they were put to shame before their friends, by their neighbors, their fellow citizens. But they stood for the name of Christ. And what a beautiful name it is for us to bear. I love that song, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. And we are blessed to bear it, the name of Jesus. Early believers suffered through trials. It is no shame. It should not be a source of shame to go through a period of trial in your life. You know, not all trials are about standing for Christ in the public sphere, public realm. There are various kinds of trials that we face in our lives. There are trials that Satan uses to try to defeat us in very personal and private ways. Some trials are physical in nature. And I suspect, I know that there are those who are listening to my voice today, they're facing trials in life because of of physical challenges in their life. There are trials that are emotional in nature. There are trials that are about our health, and there are trials that can be about our mental health. And it's real. And it is no shame to have struggles in life. It is no shame to get help with the struggles that we face in our lives. A lot of people are struggling right now. Uh, Here in our nation, there are a lot of people who are having a hard time because of the results of the pandemic that we're living through and the confinement that has resulted and and having to be isolated away from family and friends. It is a difficult, difficult trial that we are facing at this time. And nobody is exempt from it. I have some good friends who have faithfully served the Lord as pastors. And they have gone through the trials, faced trials in life because of decisions not so much made by them, but but made by other people. And in a number of cases, decisions that their own children have made that have created very, very trying and difficult and times and heartaches in their lives. That is no shame. We face trials in our lives. Peter says, do not be surprised at the fiery or the painful trial that you are suffering. He says in the 17th verse that suffering can be timely and necessary He says, for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. It is time. Oftentimes the lyrics of various songs come to my mind. As I read the scriptures, so many songs have been written based, those we use in worship certainly should be based on spiritual truth. And one one is a little chorus, in your time. You you make all things beautiful in your time. God is the God of time. He exceeds it 
But his timing is always right. Peter says it's time for judgment to begin with the family of God. I believe that the, Peter is alluding to the fact that there are times when the believer needs, the lives of the believers need to be purged and pruned and purified. Peter says that that's happening in his day. And suffering is seen as a tool that God sometimes uses to sanctify and to cleanse and to refine His people. All of us in our homes find that we, we do routine dusting. But then there's that thing called spring cleaning where we get intense about it and the efforts uh, take on a new intensity. And there are times in our lives when it seems like God is really, really working on us. Or He is, he is permitting difficulties to enter into our lives. And He uses those to strengthen and to purify us. Proverbs 3.12 says, For the Lord corrects those He loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom He delights. The Apostle Paul testified concerning his own experience he said, to keep me from becoming conceited, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Paul goes on to say that he had prayed on three different occasions, with, prayed to the Lord, pleaded with the Lord to take this thorn away, whatever it was, and the response that he got back was not what he asked for. It was not that the thorn was removed, but he was reminded that God's grace is sufficient and His power is made strong in our weakness. It is made perfect in our weakness. And so Paul said, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. Those are trials. Paul says, I delight in them, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Then I'm strong because God gives us, gave him, gives us strength in the midst of our trials. Concerning God, Jeremiah wrote, wrote though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of man. We should also remember that what we suffer now cannot be compared to what the unrighteous will suffer. That's what Peter wrote in the 17th and 18th verses. He said, for it's time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what? What will be the outcome? For those who do not obey the gospel of God. And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? One of the things we, we glean from this is that the trials that we face today bear witness that there is coming a time when there will be a judgment of all men and there will be an accounting, the difficulties of this life serve as a reminder that if God sends trials now to His church, this is evidence that one day, someday, He's going to be judging the lost. And if, if we struggle with trials now, then we are reminded of that day that is to come. We have our trials now, but the Word of God promises that we will experience glory later with our Lord. The lost, however, are experiencing all the glory that they're ever going to experience in the here and now. This is as good as it gets if you don't know Christ. And that's a discouraging thought, that this is as good as it gets. But we 
who by His grace have the precious promises and hope that are ours in Christ Jesus, we have so much to look forward to. I want better than what this world has to offer. Paul's conclusion is that, he says, therefore, or so then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. He says, don't be surprised that you're going through trials. And here's how you need to respond. So here, here's a takeaway for us, okay? He said, in response to all this, what you need to do, how you need to respond is, you need to commit yourself to your God, who is a faithful God. He is a faithful creator. That word for commit, and some of the translations render it in trust, it's a banking term a term used in banking, and it refers to the act of making a, a deposit. You, you put your funds in the bank for safekeeping. Put them there, and you know that you can count upon them. And that's the key word here. You commit yourself to the Lord because He is faithful. We can be sure that it will be worth it all. We can be sure that when Christ comes again, He will come with His reward for those who have lived for Him and trusted in Him. We will go through difficulties, but Christ will come. Our world situation may improve slightly. It may not. The attitude that our, our culture has toward the believer is likely not to get better. We're, we're, we have seen a change here in the Western world. And we remember when it wasn't like it is now. I can't promise you that those things will improve but what I can promise you is that God will be faithful and He will sustain and He will come with His reward. And there will be a day when these things will be passed and there won't be any trials and there won't be any tears and there won't be any death and there won't be any grief and it will be worth it all. And it's all because God is faithful. I hear the question every now and again, what is this world coming to? We know what it's coming to. We know what it's coming to. It's coming to a day when Christ Jesus will return. And this, this earth and its works will be purified by fire. And God will usher in His eternal kingdom and those who have placed their trust in Him will live everlastingly in the presence of their God. God is faithful. So when trials come, and they will come, they have come, we rest in His faithfulness, we rest in Him. Annie Johnson Flint is a songwriter of years back. She wrote a, a hymn that was published in the early days of World War II, but she, she wrote it earlier. She was no longer living by then. Annie Johnson Flint lost her mother at age three. Her mother was giving birth to a, another sibling. She lost her father, who at this time, while, while her mother was dying, her her dad was suffering from an incurable illness that would take his life. Her dad willed her and her sibling to other family members to raise. She became a teacher. She grew up, went to school, became a teacher, and very, very early on, just, just a few years into it, 
was diagnosed with crippling arthritis at a young age, and she became an invalid. And uh, her her life was was shortened. She she suffered with a great deal of debilitating pain. I didn't mention that her parents that had adopted her died young as well. Uh, and, and so she didn't get to enjoy them as long as she would have. But she wrote some beautiful, beautiful songs. Among those are the, the words that I'm going to share with you. This woman who faced so many difficulties and so many trials wrote concerning our Lord, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the laborers increase. To added affliction He addeth His mercy to multiplied trials, His multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance when our strength has failed ere the day is half done. When we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving, full giving is only begun. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of the infinite riches in Jesus... He giveth and giveth and giveth again. May His grace be yours today, brother, sister. He is there for you and His grace is available. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for You are faithful to us. Thank You that your love toward us knows no end, no boundary. Thank you, Lord, that when we are out our, at our weakest, you are still strong. Father, likely there are those hearing my words this morning who need your help right now. Thank you for those times when you remind us that your help is there for us when you remind us that we're not intended to live life in our own strength, but we must rely upon you. Draw near to your people. Remind them of your faithfulness. Remind them of your purposes for them. Remind them that you'll never leave them nor forsake them. Remind them that even in the midst of trials, that, Lord, they can bear the name of Christ with no sense of shame. So, Lord, have your way, for I ask it in the name of our Savior. Amen.